Hey guys, it's Code Sane here, and in this video, I'm going to be giving you the ultimate guide to building a great FLL robot. The robot itself is the first step to having a successful robot game. So with these five tips, I'm going to be showing you exactly what you need to do to build a great robot. Also, stick around until the end because I've got a very special surprise that will be helpful for you and your team. So without further ado, let's get into the first tip. Tip number one is figuring out which motors and sensors you're going to use in your robot. So when I say sensors and motors, they're also known as components. These electrical components are what allow you to drive your robot and sense different things on the FLL map. The first two components you are definitely going to need on your robot are your drive motors. Your drive motors are essentially what drive your robot. So I'm going to be using two medium motors for that. Once you've figured out your drive motors, this is also a great opportunity to find out which wheels you want to use. I'm going to be using the large blue spike prime wheels. However, the small blue spike prime wheels are also a great option, as well as the thick tires from the EV3 kit. And there are also some great motorcycle tires you can use. Now that we've decided our first two components, we're going to need to choose four more. Of course, the Spike Prime Hub only has six ports, so we only have four left to fill. I highly encourage you to use attachment motors. Attachment motors will help drive your mechanized attachment on the robot game. So when you have special missions that you need to do with attachments, these motors are going to help. I'm going to be using two large motors to do this. And with the final two ports, you can choose between a variety of sensors. So of course you have the force sensor, the ultrasonic sensor, and the color sensors. So I'm going to be using two color sensors as this is a very popular choice. It will allow us to make some very good programs later down the track. However, you can also experiment with the force sensor and the ultrasonic sensor. So the following configuration, as you can see, is one of the very popular configurations to choose from. We have two large motors to drive the attachments, two medium motors to drive the wheels, and two color sensors which will help us down the track for line following, and of course the Spike Prime Hub. It's completely up to you what configuration you want to use, but bear in mind the only thing you need to worry about is why you're using these sensors. So if you don't have a good enough reason to choose a force sensor or a color sensor, then don't go ahead with it. It's okay to just have five out of the six or four out of the six. Make sure you can reason your decisions because this is what's going to matter when it comes to judging. Let's move to tip number two. So tip number two is going to be starting your build from the wheels, or what's better known as the drivetrain. So the drivetrain is essentially the part of the robot that helps you drive. So these are going to be our two medium motors for this video. Connecting those two first is going to be very helpful because it allows you to start from the base and then work upwards. Once you've built a solid drivetrain, you can start thinking about the rest of your components. So the next logical thing to do is to connect your attachment motors. For your attachment motors, I highly recommend facing them upwards so that the rotation is going to be upwards. I'll explain why this is helpful in a tip later on. As you can see, I've connected the attachment motors directly to the drivetrain. After that, you can move to the sensors and of course the third wheel. So if you're choosing to use color sensors, make sure you have the correct distance. It needs to be about one to three holes and anything higher than that isn't going to work. Anything lower than that isn't going to work either. Having the perfect distance for your color sensors is going to be very important. So be sure to spend time to get it correct. The third wheel is essential because it'll help your robot balance. Experiment with a few different designs and how you can keep this third wheel at the correct location. Keeping it a further distance away from your drive wheels is essential so that the robot balances properly. Now that we've connected all of our components together, starting with the drivetrain, moving to the attachment motors and done the color sensors, the last thing to do is connect the spike prime hub. So this is of course one of the things that you need to do last because this is the brain of the robot and we're starting from the feet going upwards. Connecting the spike prime hub, you don't need to worry about too much. You can either put it sideways or vertically. Uh, I've put it sideways in this video just to make the design symmetrical, however you can choose to use it vertically if you wish. Two key things to remember when experimenting where all your placement of your motors and your sensors are going to go is symmetry and gaps. So with gaps, you want to minimize any large gaps or voids through your robot. Some gaps are very hard to minimize and you may have a few gaps here and there, but just make sure that you don't have too large of a robot because this isn't going to be compact or rigid enough. The second thing that is key is symmetry. As you can see on this design, the whole robot is symmetrical. What you can see on one side is the exact same thing on the other side. This is important because it allows for a weight balance of the robot. If your robot is imbalanced in terms of weight, it's going to veer toward one side when you're programming and that's going to cause a lot of headaches. So make sure you've minimized your gaps by making your robot nice and compact and made it symmetrical. 
Let's move on to tip number three. So tip number three is about how to connect those different components together. When you're, for example, creating your drivetrain, you may be tempted to just put a couple of pins in and try to connect it that way. But you'll see this isn't a very rigid design. As you can see, as soon as I try to bend or flex the design, it comes apart. Trying to bend and flex your robot is really good to see how strong it is because if it does break apart when you apply a bit of pressure, that's just not going to hold up in terms of the FLL map and the game. And the last thing you want is a broken robot during a robot run, trust me. If you find that your design is bending and flexing when you apply a bit of pressure, don't stress. All you need to do is stabilize it. Stabilizing it is very easy. Apply beams and frames in the direction where it's bending. So if you find that it's bending horizontally, as you can see this one, you can just apply a beam directly horizontally. This will limit any bending and flexing and it will help when it comes to increasing the rigidity of your design. Tip number four is using neat wiring techniques and using a frame system. So when it comes to wiring, you want to limit any wires that are brushing against wheels and you also want to make it look good. Aside from brushing and damaging the wires if it's turning against wheels, you also want your robot to look aesthetically pleasing. So when it comes to judging, this is one of the things they see. So you don't want to see just random wires going in many directions and massive loops. You want to make sure your wiring is nice and tight. To make your wires tight, you can wrap them around different parts of your robot and maybe the drivetrain, as you can see here. I've looped the wire around to make it nice and tight, but I've also managed to make it a good fit when I plug it into the ports. Another great tool are the alligator clips. The alligator clips are very helpful when it comes to directing your wires and guiding them through certain portions of your robot. So you can see one of your wires may drag down and hit the wheel. All you need to do is grab an alligator clip, connect it to a nearby hole, and this will hold the wire in place. Now, once you've done this and you've wired all six components, you'll see that your robot may still not be looking as good as possible. This is because the difference between good teams and great teams is a frame system. A frame system can help change your robot from looking like this to this. As you can see, the frame system has neatly contained all of the wires, so you can't see anything kind of looping around and it's not going to affect any of your attachments. When building your frame, make sure you've connected the frame to many parts of your robot. As you can see, it's connected to the top here and it's also connected to the side wheels and the back. This allows for a rigid frame that isn't going to shake off during the game. Having a frame system also looks visually appealing, which is a positive the judges like to see. This all black design is a personal favorite of mine, but you can choose any colors you like. Perhaps you can make it your team colors to suit your team inspiration and identity. Another great benefit of the frame is having the robot connect to your outer wheels. As you can see, an outer wheel that isn't constrained by the frame allows to wiggle and allows movement side to side. This is gonna cause veer during the game. However, if you connect the frame outer wheel to the robot, through an axle. It's going to constrain your wheel and only go in the forwards and backwards direction. This is going to make your robot go perfectly straight all the time. Now, a frame system isn't only helpful to make your robot look nicer. It also helps with the final and possibly most helpful tip of all, tip five, using dog gears. These are gears that sit on top of your frame, as you can see here, but underneath, they're actually connected to the motors. Your attachment motors will drive your dog gears, which will help drive any attachments that you have. This will allow for making it super quick when swapping any attachments on and off your robot. And as you know, you only have two minutes and 30 seconds during the game. So when you wanna do multiple missions or within the time frame, you're gonna to need to have many attachments. These attachments can slip on and off the robot very quickly using the dog gears. Also, by using the blue crisscross pins and a frame, you can see that it can slip on the robot on and off very simply and easily. The key is having another bevel gear. As you can see, I've used the beige one on the side. This helps mesh with the black one on the robot. As the black dog gear turns, the bevel beige gear on the attachment side also turns as well. This is super helpful and quick when it comes to swapping attachments. It also allows for a secure fit because the crisscross pins aren't gonna come out unless the whole robot flips upside down, which is very unlikely in an FLL game. If you didn't have these dog gears sitting on top of your frame, you'd have to connect all of your motorized attachments directly to that attachment motor, which is going to be very cumbersome during the game when your technicians have to take out pins and pull pins in, because as you know, connecting things with pins uh, directly is a very tough process. Under time pressure and stress, this is almost impossible to do effectively and efficiently. Thus, the dog gears are very helpful when it comes to solving many missions quickly and reliably. Finally, even if you're not using a motorized attachment, you can still use the same attachment frame. So you don't have to connect it with any of the beige gears, it'll just slip on and off, and that passive attachment works as well as a motorized attachment. Thus, this frame system 
really helps when it comes to creating a uniform frame-like design for all of your attachments because they'll just slip on and off. Really, your attachments are what score you points in the FLL robot game. So having a great robot might be the first step, but the second step and the most important one that you should spend a lot of time on is building great attachments that work well with your dog gears. They could be motorized, they could be passive, which just means they don't need to use any dog gears. But working hard to create great attachments to solve many missions at a time is what you need to do to have a high score during the robot game. So those were the five tips to build the ultimate robot for the robot game. Now the most important thing to remember is that building in general is a learning process. So when it comes to building, you need to keep in mind that you may have one design, but you're going to improve that design over time. You may need to change things or get rid of it completely and iterate it over and over until you have the perfect design. As promised, since you've stuck around to the end, I'll mention the surprise that I've got. So if you'd like to build this exact robot step by step, I've got building instructions linked in the description below. You can go ahead, download them and build this exact same robot frame and all. This is good if you're a rookie team who would just like to start and see what designs are like, or if you're an experienced team and you'd like to continue improving your skills. Just remember, this design is for inspiration purposes only. So definitely continue to improve this design and make your own attachments for it. If you found this video helpful, definitely leave a like below and share it with your teammates as well as other teams that may find it also helpful throughout the season. I'll be releasing more programming and building videos as the season goes along, so definitely hit the subscribe button as well to not miss out on anything. That's pretty much it, I'll see you guys in the next one.